Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm here tonight with Steve and Stephen Skiff of Skiff Made Blades, custom knife uh, extraordinaires, and uh, people who have come up a lot on this show recently. And uh, gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is my pleasure. So uh, we've had a few... Um, father-son teams on the show. And to me, uh, I always get uh, fascinated with family knife stories, family business stories. I love small business stories. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the, the courage and striking out on your own. And then when a family does it, to me, that's an even more compelling story. Uh, tell me a little bit about Skiff Blades, how it happened, and uh, where this love of knives came from. Uh, for me, it happened. I Basically, back in 1998, um, I had some knife books around. My stepfather was big into guns, and he always had gun digests around, and there were a few knife books there. So, I, you know, I looked through those a little bit, kind of got oriented with what, you know, was going on in the world at the time. That's quite a while ago now. Um, I was a heavy equipment mechanic most of my life, and when you're a heavy equipment mechanic, you do a lot of welding and uh, building up of um, hard face on buckets and whatnot. So my son was in the backyard uh, cutting down trees with bow saws and whatnot. And I thought, hey, I'll, I'll make him a hatchet. I had a nice thick piece of stainless and I thought I would uh, weld an edge on it that would hold up forever. And it really didn't work out that well. Um, it just kept cracking. The weld wouldn't stay, it was too hard. And uh, and so that got me looking into stainless steels. And, I, and back then, one of the big steels to use was ATS 34. It was a good stainless steel, readily available. So I started buying some of that and uh, making some knives. Um, I also used a lot of 01 tool steel back then because it was easy to heat treat. You know, I could heat up anything cherry red, get it so a magnet wouldn't stick to it and quench it. And um, from there, it was uh, trying to figure out what kind of um, patterns people would like. I knew what I liked. Um, so, I, you know, the same thing. I looked through the magazines and whatnot, got ideas of what different blade shapes there were. Um, so you, there. Said that, you said that you were interested in what patterns other people like, but you knew what patterns you liked. What patterns did you like, and what did you kind of ascertain people were looking for at the time? I actually just liked the, the regular four-inch drop, drop point hunter type knife seemed to be all around good use for anything I would be doing. Um, a friend of mine that I worked with was an avid hunter and he showed me what he had. And um, one was like, um, they call it a trailing point. It's a little more pointed. Um, he also had uh, like a straight sharp finger. It's a very small blade, a smaller blade than I would think most people would want, but I just didn't know any better at the time, you know? Um, so I, I made um, some knives that he actually drew, um, you know, on a piece of paper, a picture he thought would make a nice knife. I made one for him. He tried it out. He said, you know, hey, the guys I'm hunting with like it, get a, they get one, you know. Yeah. And, of course, at this time, I'm not really selling them. I'm thinking, you know, I'm just making these. I'm almost giving them away. Um, as time went by, you know, other family members would say, hey, um, I had an idea for a knife. Could you make something? And, um I don't know, after making probably 20 knives, many of those that, you know, really I overground or they didn't work out right. You know, you do that. Eventually, um, I came out with three, what I would call models one, two, and three. Pretty simple, um, basic shapes, but it, I, I learned to grind them well. And um, back then I was just using wood for handles. Um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of what well, they would call them exotic handle materials because it would be exotic if they were on a gun maybe, but not so much on a knife. But I didn't know any better. There's a lot of coca bola handles, things like that. And um, um, I think, so, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask Stephen. So you were you were the uh, kid that got the axe, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did it work? How did that work out? It worked really well. It, it ended up being out of aluminum because he couldn't get the other one working. So he made it out of aluminum and I just basically had to hit it harder and <laughs> things still, you know, fell off the tree and branches came down and I had a lot of use of it. It's, it's, I kept looking at it because it's, it's sitting right over here. Oh, pull it. Let's, it. Let's see it. You know, when you have a chance, uh, sure. grab it. Um, so I'm curious, uh, your, your dad, you know, your, 
your dad makes you an axe. I mean, how awesome is that? And then, uh, and then your dad's making knives too. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's cool. That looks as a, as a 14 year old kid getting to play with something like this is pretty fun. Yes. You know, it has a hole in it so you can hang it on stuff. And the fact that your father made it, uh, and gave it to you, uh, you know, lets you know that there's more of that in the future and it will be better. So did your father's enthusiasm for knives at this point, like rub off on you or were, have you guys stoked one another's enthusiasm for no? Now? How does that? How <laughs> no, that work? Be, being a fourteen-year-old kid, not being able to really do a lot of the stuff, I was uh, relegated to just making uh, leather sheaths at the time. And I got about you know a couple days into learning how to do that and messed up a bunch of leather. And I was like, I'm no good at this. I can't do this. I'm gonna go play some computer games. And uh, I stopped doing any of that stuff. So <laughs> it, at the time, you were just making straight blades, and it wasn't that interesting to me. Uh, I really got interested, you know, probably about five, six years ago when he got bigger into making the, the folders. He had made them for a while, but he, he stumbled upon a really nice design people liked and couldn't re really get them made fast enough. So he wanted me to come in and help him. Which which design was that? Uh, that would be the, the accomplice. And you named uh, them, right. right? You named the knives. Is that right? The, the naming on the knives is, just, man, it's it's one of the hard things to do. I don't, I don't know if you ever tried to name something. It's like naming a kid. Yeah, everybody has to agree on it. it has to be a cool name. Um, we go through like it's like a family affair trying to get some of these knives n named, yeah. and that's the accomplice was the one that that we liked the most. We didn't want to come up with something that was really, you know, too aggressive or too too light. We want something right in the middle, yeah. and we feel like the accomplice is a good a, a good name. And then that's the, the same kind of naming we try to the same naming scheme we try to keep with all of our knives. Well, that that actually uh, you know uh, well that works because. Uh, that knife is one half menace, one half, you know, artwork, y you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. so a name like that is fitting. It's not, it's not committing to the menace, but it's implying it. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to get. Okay. So you, you came in and started helping your dad when he started making folders. Uh, Steve, when you started, why did you start making that move to folders? Well, you know, you get sick of making straight knives and, it's, you know, you're going to knife shows at this point, blade show and whatnot, and you're seeing what other people are doing. Yeah. And I had made um, what we would call gentleman folders back in 2006, seven and eight. And um, so I like the folders. And then um, somewhere around the long line flippers came out. I'm sorry, before you go further, describe what a gentleman's folder was in 2006. I mean, right now we have an idea 14 years later of what that means. Uh, okay, that like mean? a three-inch three, three inch blade, fairly small. Um, it would probably have mother of pearl handle on it or mammoth ivory with um, hmm. uh, Damascus bolsters, a Damascus blade. Um, have a little file work on it. Okay, so, all right. So the, when you said gentleman's blade, to me, I think maybe non-locking and mm -hmm. small, pocketable, somewhat classy, but I was not thinking uh, Mammoth Ivory, uh, which is one of the most sumptuous and beautiful uh, uh, materials out there. So, okay, you were making that kind of work and you were seeing yeah. what other people were buying at Blade Show. Yeah, and, and I really kind of wanted to get into frame locks, but for myself, all I had was, um, you know, a bandsaw, a regular milling machine, stuff like that. So, it's, Kind of took a long time to uh, get what I wanted out of it. The, the very first one I I made that was a frame lock that I made multiple of called the Cohort. Um, that was not a flipper. Um, but that kind of started things off um, in a weird way. Uh, basically, I had sold one to a dealer who went to Blade Show, and Jim Skelton bought it. Mm -hmm. and, and then I didn't even really know who he was. And he, he called me, and he said, hey, I got this knife I, that you made. I really like it, and I want to do a review on it. And, you know, of course, what am I going to say? This, this is great, you know. Um, so he said, you're probably going to get some orders for it if you want. I don't know if I should tell people your books are open or what, you know. So that kind of put me on the spot. You know, at that point, I really didn't take many orders. I kind of made it what I want. And so I thought, you know, I should just take orders. We'll see how it goes. I mean, what's going to happen? I'm going to get 20 knives I have to make, you know. They'll all be the same. They'll be different in anodizing. They could be different in blade materials, but, you know, the handle shape would be the same. At that point, 
I would be getting them just water jet cut so I'd have blanks to work with. But the rest would be all my milling machine and stuff like that. So he does the review and I got like 100 orders. Wow. I had them spread out. You know, I thought, well, I could do four or five a month, you know, at the time. But um, I, I started looking at them like I'm, I'm never going to get these done. So that's when um, I asked Steve, you know, hey, can you help me? And he said, well, what would I do? I said, I, geez, you know, I'm. I'm thinking about a CNC machine, but I'm a little worried that learning how to operate that properly is kind of like knife making all by itself. It's like relearning something that's out. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, I, I tricked him. I said, hey, why don't you watch a couple of these videos, uh, Tuesday Knife Making with John Grimsmo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. knew that I knew that would do it because I, I think they're roughly around the same age. And I think they like the same things. And to me, I thought Steve's going to look at this kind of like a puzzle. I know he likes computers and figuring things out. Yeah. But, you know, learn how to run a machine like that, that you push a button to go is going to be something he's going to have to want to figure out. Well, that yeah. is that is a smart move as, a, a, you know, a man of your generation to to bring, you know enlist your son, mm -hmm. a man of his generation to help with the new machinery. And, and so, I mean, that, that seems like a, you know, a match made in heaven. So mm -hmm. Stephen, when you started coming into the shop, you said at first you were doing leather work and stuff, or that was probably when you were much younger. Mm -hmm. um, but five years ago, when you became uh, maybe a more uh, more equal part of the operation, what, what do you feel you brought to things? Um, uh, what, what do you think you brought to your father's product? So uh, I, around... 2001, 2002, I moved away to go to college and my dad continued on doing his own thing. I wasn't involved in knife making. I would talk to him and we, I would see what he's doing, things like that, and just kind of keep abreast of it. But uh, I came home, I mean, I came home. I, I got a job out of college and but at this time I had to move away to get a job. So I moved like two hours away. They're working in career uh, in software development and working for corporations, little corporations, small corporations. And then towards the end, I, I got a little, not towards the end, in a couple years into it, I got a little bored and I realized he needs some help. And uh, this is kind of shaping up. So I'm like, this is pretty interesting. Um, so I, uh, I, he, I remember the conversation where this all started. He's told me about the, the videos to watch. And then he said, well, I talked to one of these CNC machine shops and to make these bolsters, they want like $3,000 because they want to make a bunch of them and that's as low as I can get it to go. So I was like, Oh, well, you know, let, let's, you know, let's wait on that. And then I went home and secretly figured out how to uh, buy a CNC kit online and buy a, a Grizzly G0704 milling machine, had them all delivered, got the CNC conversion done and started figuring out how to work it. And it was probably about a month worth of work on the weekends and after hours. And then one day my dad came over and was like, just visiting. I said, Hey, you want to go out and see my CNC machine? And <laughs> he said, uh, he's like, sure. He, he didn't even, he probably thought I was kidding. And I came out and I showed it to him, fired it up and we made a part. And he was like, Oh my God, I can't believe this, this is great. So, um, you know, that's how that started. But what I bring to it is I bring, uh, a, some corporate background, right? So I've, I work in the corporate sector. So I, I'm used to deadlines. I'm used to organization. I'm used to, a lot of the corporate level stuff that you don't get in a family business a lot of times. Yeah. So yeah. I try to bring some of that in, um, try to keep us focused, keep us on task, uh, try to shape things a little better. Um, Cause when you're a, a, you know, an entrepreneur, a one man show, you kind of can get off in the weeds sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I try to help keep us focused. Yeah. I, I know what a can chart is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually that makes sense. I, I I've done so much, um, so many jobs outside of what I consider my real job in my life that I've gained so much, you know, working in offices and that kind of thing, you gain a skill set that that you you don't necessarily actively go out and seek as a young man. I'm gonna go out and learn how to use Excel. But mm -hmm. in some really jobs, it, yeah, some jobs you gotta <laughs> learn that. And then you realize it makes your life easier when you're doing your dream job. So Pay attention when you're in those those mm -hmm. lame jobs, no matter what they are, you're going to get something out of them and it's going to pay back dividends uh, later. Uh, so, Stephen, I I'm sorry uh, to, to cut you off right there. Were you a knife guy? Were you carrying pocket knives? Were you uh, did you show uh, your dad what the youngsters, what the younger guys are carrying, that kind of thing? No, um, I, I carry 
like a, a box cutter, like one of the folding box cutters. It's usually what I would carry around mm-hmm. um, for opening up packages at work and things like that. Um, I like knives. I'm just never really, it never really dawned on me to like get into knives and collect them and carry them. Even though my dad was a maker, it just never really dawned on me. It just wasn't in my wheelhouse at the time. So Steve, wh- what were the knives that inspired you to uh, to uh, go from uh, what you were doing? You said you were a machinist, machinist, right? You were doing a lot a of heavy work. equipment mechanic. A heavy equipment mechanic. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you're doing that kind of work. Why did you decide to make knives instead of another tool like wrenches or hammers, or you know, or 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 do woodworking or anything else? Why was it knives? I don't really, I don't have any one thing I can say this was it other than, you know, I'm a guy, I like knives, <laughs> especially once you start folding knives, they're kind of like getting like a gadget now, you know, and, um, you know, just something intriguing about it. So who are the, uh, who are the knife makers and designers uh, uh, and companies that inspire you? What, because uh, uh, I mean, you look, uh, you look at the culprit, for instance, uh, or, or the accomplice, those are the two I'm most familiar with. Uh, visually, and they're they're dazzling uh, in their milling. You know, they're 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 beautifully uh, executed and sculpted. And I, I have to admit, I've never held one in my hand. Unfortunately, I, that will change at some point in the future. But uh, at, but I have heard from people that I trust that they're exquisitely made, and and everything about them is excellent from a from a collector's point of view. Thank you for saying. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. So, but but also they have a profile. They have a, they have a something about them has an aggressiveness that that resonates with me. Um, what what kind of folding knives do, do you consume or do you like? Uh, what what has filtered through to make these things? I like all shapes and sizes. I we, we used to make a, a little knife that had a three inch blade. We don't make it right now. It's called the the bandit. Um, that was a, a neat little knife. I thought it was a nice uh, size to put in your pocket. I like the blade shape of it. Um, you know what happens? So you go to shows and customers, they're telling you what they're looking for and what they want. And I have ideas in my head and they'll say, you know, well, I kind of would like a knife that's roughly the same shape, but maybe, you know, maybe with a three and a half inch blade or something like that. And and um, I'll, you know, I've always got a lot of ideas in my head. I have ideas in my head now and just it's a matter of when's a good time to bring them out, you know. Um, I'm looking for um, I'm looking for nice blade grinds. That's mostly what I'm trying to accomplish is have um, nice crisp looking blade grinds and, and grind a lot of the blade. I'm really lightening the blade up. Most of our grinds, you know, are pretty high on the blade. I will usually put some type of top grind on it. And that's usually to looks nice visually. We don't sharpen the top of it, but it lightens the blade up some. Um, and so anyways, you know, a lot of it, of what we come up with to make comes from customer input and just ideas that come to fruition over a while. So <clears throat> how does your design process work with the two of you? Is it is it a back and forth or uh, how does it yeah. work? It's, it's a back and forth. When he first learned how to draw with CAD, um, I had made it a small knife back then. We didn't even have a name for it. We only made four or five of them, but it was pretty small. I said, hey, can you see if uh, um, I think we can put a flipper tab on this knife and we can put an internal stop pin on it. And um, I sent him a few pictures and he drew some CAD. We went back and forth for a while. It took us quite a while. Finally, we landed on something and and, and it worked out. But what we do now is, um, and like I said, from customer input and things that we're seeing that we like. Um, I can't really put, put my finger on it, but a lot of times it's the materials we see out there are that we like. Um, so anyways, what, what I do now is I'll draw a quick picture. I'll say, this is kind of what I have in mind. And he'll be like, oh yeah, that looks pretty cool. Why don't we go with something like that? One of them was the, the, the accomplice. Um, we had a lot of people say, we really love it, but we'd like something with just a little smaller blade on it, mm-hmm. you know? but maybe the, roughly the same shape. So, you know, the idea was to dwarf that down, but just to dwarf it down, it still, it didn't look like a, a mini accomplice. So I changed the shape of it a little here and there in, in the grind and the way the, the blade overall silhouette of it was. And I'd show him a picture of it and he'd be like, yeah, that looks pretty cool. So then I'll make an actual working model of it. 
And so, it, you know, we have the uh, lock in the right place and the detent in the right spot and lo- the stop pin will be in the right spot. Everything will be just about right on it. And then when I have it the way I want it, I'll grind the blade bevels. And then um, I'll bring it to Steve. He's two hours away. So either we're, we're going to meet each other somehow. And um, anyways, we'll look at it together and we'll say, hey, let's tweak this area. And after I got done making it, I'll realize, you know, geez, I wish I did this on the edge of it. Or maybe this spot should have been a little more straight or a little more rounded. We'll make those little notes together. And then um, he'll take it home and he'll do a CAD drawing on what we talked about. And then after we have the CAD drawing, we'll look at that maybe and say, okay, let's just change this a little bit and that a little bit. And then when we're happy with it, he'll cut the first one. He'll cut all the parts, the blade and everything. And, uh, lock bar the whole bit and then um he'll send it to me and i'll put the first one together and from there i'll say oh we need to change this a little bit or that a little bit um and then that's it from there um we usually commit to 50 knives um um basically i go right to uh three rivers manufacturing we'll send them the drawings of what we want um for the titanium they'll cut the 50 pieces and then we usually get them double disc ground and sent to me um and for blades i'll buy the plates the steel i'll buy the plates steve will send a a cad drawing to where we have the water jet cut done and they'll cut the blades and then uh, of course we still just have cut parts at this point and then steve does all the stuff on the handles except for bearing pockets and uh and then i do everything on the blade and he'll make me some back spacers wow and and then he'll make some clips and um you know, for a while he was making discs. Now I'm making the discs totally myself. We go back and forth because, you know, he knows what he can do with his machine and I know what I can do with what I have. So on some of the easier stuff, it's just easier for me to do it here. You know, it sounds I mean, the way you're describing it right now, <clears throat> it sounds like such an integrated process. I mean, truly, uh, you know, truly a back and forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's kind of interesting that uh, generationally it's like you both have your angles covered very well you know steven you with the you with the cad and the milling and steve you with the with the handmade and the experience grinding and that kind of thing it seems like a a really do uh do you think your relationship the fact that your father and son that you share genetic material that you uh steven that you were raised by this man steven do you think that there's something to your relationship that adds to the to the fluidity of your work experience Oh yeah. I mean, it, me and my father get along really well. Uh, there's, you know, w- we can both be kind of prickly just like everybody can be. Uh, but my dad in general is really easy to get along with. So it's really easy to talk to him. It's really easy to bring up problems that I don't like things that I'm like, oh, I really just don't like this because I don't like it. It doesn't speak to me. So let's change it. Um, you know, there's been a couple instances of that, but for the most part, it's really just, we're on the same wavelength. We think alike. Um, you know, we try to apply our our own means to the same problems to try to solve them differently. Like he mentioned with the, the discs, we were cutting them out uh, on a sheet and then I would send them to him as discs and he would put them on the lathe and put a tape around them, make them the right size and make them perfect. And it was taking a lot of time on my side. So we ended up trying to find a different way to do it. And we figured out a way to make it more efficient and cheaper while keeping everything, you know, in town, if you will. So uh, it's really it makes it easy to talk to them. It makes it easy. I don't have to worry about uh, making them upset by making a change or bringing up something that we don't want to talk about. It's really easy to work with them. Um, our design tastes are similar. Um, there's a lot of freedom between us. You know, I handle a lot of the, the handle material stuff and not the handle material, the handle shape mm-hmm. stuff, uh, the CNC work on that. And I don't do any blade work and he handles all the blade work. Um, I don't really know about blades so much. I know about titanium and handles. So I do, I focus on making those the best I can. And he focuses on making the, the, uh, the blades as best he can, and then taking all of it and mashing it together and making it perfect. All right. Well, something that occurs to me when I look at your knives, uh, is, is the very sculptural, uh, feel of them aspect of them. The, the handles are, are sculpted beautifully and the grinds are crisp and, and the blade shapes and all everything about the blade is gorgeous. Steven, with the with the sculpting on the handles, like how what uh, what kind of process is that for you? I mean, you look at it and it's dazzling and beautiful, but at the same time, it also looks mathematical. And so, is this a way you can express yourself, or is this a, a 
is this a way you can express yourself? Is this an expression of your artistic vision? Yeah, it's a, I, I hate to say artistic vision. I don't consider myself an, an artist. Um, I really, I strive for symmetry. It, it really, I really like symmetry in, in all the stuff that I do. So I try to apply that to this, uh, to the handles. Uh, I, I like to use a lot of the, the lines that are already on the, the handle and try to make those into what we, we call it like a, a 3D milling. So we have, you know, the, there's three different planes that we have in life. In addition, then we have the disc and we basically make a drawing and then lay it down on top of that that surface and it'll take the shape of that and then I can apply I can make tool pass to go over those lines so all of our 3d milling is sketch driven they call it where instead of making a, a, a cam path you know a computer aided machining path based on an area I actually assign each line that we mill based on the sketch so it, it takes a while to do that um, but it's really the only way to get it the way I want it to do and it's working really well uh, I it's what we've been doing a lot lately because it really works well for us and we like it. Um, but we like to use the, the lines that are already on the knife. We think that makes a lot of, uh, a lot of sense symmetrical wise. Do you mean like the contours, the outer contours of the handle and then, and then uh, like uh, allowing those to inform what happens with the terracing and stuff on the, on the inside. So uh, on the surface somewhat. Yeah. So like, like let's say on, on the accomplice and the, uh, the the culprit. The culprit's the first one we did with that. So with that one, the the where the disc is up where the blade is, there's a like a, a triangular shape. So I took that shape, um, copied it, and then there's a central line arc that runs down the handle. Like if you drew a line from the tip down to the tail and made it in the middle, I take that corner that triangular shape and copy it a bunch of times down that arc and see where that lands. So, you know, I extend out the lines, make it a little longer and that ends up being the pattern and it works really well. And then I try to make it a little more complicated with the accomplice, which was the second one we did. I added a second uh, set of triangular shapes to them. So it has like a back and forth pattern to it mm -hmm. uh, also on an angle. And then with the drifter, it was, uh, it was curves only instead of having sharp points. So we did just curves and did the same kind of thing where we, just kind of, you know, make it follow a path. Well, it sounds to me uh, like you are an artist. Those are variations on a theme. And and uh, I think you... <laughs> so, uh, Steve, grind, mm -hmm. grinding. How did you learn to grind like that? And, and you know, because it, it makes sense that these handles and these blades match up. And mm -hmm. the, the interesting division of labor, um, where did you learn how to grind? Uh, basically self-taught. Um, I read magazines. I got knife making books. Um, one of them's, you know, uh, Bob Loveless book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and then of course you go to shows and you talk to other guys, you know, um, you know, cause I think we all start out the same way. You start out with, um, real heavy grip, <laughs> you know, try to get off as much as we can and go through the process of finer and finer belts. And then, you know, are you going to leave a belt finish on it? Or are you going to use hand rub finish? I like the hand rub finish. Um, I kind of landed on it um, five or six years ago of just repeating that. Um, I, I really like it. I mean, when you put small scratches on it, it's easy to put small scratches on it. Um, but um, well, that's you get out, if someone sends one back to me after they had it for a couple of years and they want a spot treatment, I can usually make the blade look like it was new. Um, but large scratches don't seem to show it's bad. You know, it's just, it's a nice compromise, I think. Even even belt, uh, if you leave a belt finish on the blade, for instance, you can still see a scratch across that, you know. So it's um, the, our knives are expensive, you know. They're they're um, they're not cheap. We spend a lot of time on them, and I like to have the blade very refined from one edge to the other. The flats are usually polished almost to a mirror. They're um, they're not quite a mirror. They, they probably look like a mirror at first, but if you look at it really close, you'll see small lines in it. Uh, the blade itself is a 1500 grit finish. Um, how, how long do you spend uh, on each knife, if you can estimate? Um, we're still spending a lot of time on them. Um, at least 12 hours on a knife yet. Yeah. We think you could go a lot faster than that. Um, but we just, <laughs> that's why they cost what they cost. It's yeah, that, a lot of time on them. To uh, me, so a lot of things we try, I try to make processes for a lot of part of it. Um, I think, you know, if Steve and I both worked out of the same shop, shop we could probably cut it down some 
But mm-hmm. basically what I'm doing, I'm building a blade almost completely without a handle set. That's 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 the way it, we have a, a pattern set that we follow. So I make the blade fit this pattern. I know the holes in the, the um, handle sets that Steve's going to send me are going to be in the same spot. Mm-hmm. Um, have, you know, a little bit of adjustment. And um, so I'm building the blades ahead of time. Then um, the handles will show up and then. You know, he makes like the backspacer, for instance. Um, it fits eighty percent. I don't, you know, I don't know how long it takes him to make it. <laughs> Twenty minutes, maybe, maybe, maybe fifteen minutes. But I'll spend um, forty-five minutes, um, you know, polishing it and making it so it's uh, real nice and shiny and anodized, and it looks like a real nice piece. I'll, I'll, you know, spend a lot of time on that. And then, you know, the assembly. You would think, oh, you could just throw this thing together. Well. Even though there's not hardly any adjustments on them, you put them together and take them apart enough times until they work as perfect as you can make it, you know. And And I imagine you have to do that with tremendous care because you're dealing with uh, beautifully machined pieces and beautifully ground pieces and oftentimes uh, crazy high-end materials. So you have to be very careful with that assembly, uh, I would imagine. I mean, I'm shocked when you say 12 hours. To Mm -hmm. me, that seems like no time at all. Well, and, you know, that's standard materials. If we're going to use, you know, Damascus and and um, damas steel and stuff like that, then we're adding a lot of time to it. But for the what we call the standard build, that's what it takes. So, Stephen, for uh, uh, you, so you're going from standard materials to um, I, I don't even know what the crazy materials are, mokutai and 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 different things. Does that change your process at all? I would imagine, Steve, it changes yours because every material, if you're doing things by hand. Materials have different properties. Stephen, for you and dealing with the milling and all of that, how does the change in materials af- affect things? So uh, usually we just do titanium and timascus. Usually the ones that we we do at least on the mill. So I try to, you know, I originally I started out being like, oh, I'll just figure out a way to fixture it, and you know, we'll mill whatever. But as we get more and more standardized, I find myself getting into the same kind of like, uh, you know, patterns that the big CNC shops will get into where they they don't want to make a bunch, right? So I put a lot of time in making fixtures. I, I don't have the time to really make a little fixture to, to, to mill this one-off thing because I have a full-time job and you want me to make 10 handle sets this week and I only have, you know, six hours to work this week. So I really can't spend time doing that. So we end up getting into a spot where we just end up doing titanium and timascus here and there. Um, so there's not a lot of, you know, variation on my side I, I we tried doing some carbon fiber and we haven't gotten there yet and we probably will but for the most part titanium timascus and uh to do titanium i have my set sp- speeds and feeds and mm-hmm. for timascus i just usually go a little slower and i get good results so steve with the uh with the st- with the blade steels uh mm-hmm. uh you experience uh, uh i would imagine some some variation in in how that works uh, what materials do you like to work with? And, uh, you know, when you guys, and this is an open question to both of you, when you guys are designing something, um, it, it's assumed, I would imagine, that you can use any sort of, any of those fancy materials that you use, uh, well, mm-hmm. that or uh, a time ask is, but um, when you're making them, are, how much do aesthetics, how much does the look of the knife uh, factor into what you're designing? Well, Do you want to you go know, ahead? yeah, I think I understand what you're trying to ask on it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was a terrible. <laughs> How much does the look of the knife matter? Like, are you all about utility and making a, a a fantastically sculpted and created knife that's just for utility, or are you thinking of these things as things of beauty, like most of us do? Um, well, they they start out as utility. I mean, and that's one of the reasons we went with the three D milling is that we wanted it it's it's nice grippy it looks real good um it hides scratches it just you know it's got some nice natural things about it so in the beginning um we're trying to um have a utilitarian um although they're as i brought up before they're kind of expensive for utilitarian but uh, they just have a nice clean look to them Mm -hmm. so then you know um you always want to put on a nice blade and I love damas steel. So I'll make a damas steel blade on there and, um, and then usually something, 
you know, there has to be something to go with it. So, and that's one of the reasons we, we continue to have the disc. When I first started making um, uh, the let frame box, I liked having the disc as an over travel, you know. But, me, okay. All right. That's I was going to say. Let me stop you right there. When you say disc, are you talking about the large pivot? Uh, yeah, it's the large pivot. Some, you know, it be, uh, if it was a little smaller, it'd just be called a pivot collar, but it's an actual disc. It does two things on our knives. It, it keeps the stop pin from falling out. Our stop pin's not pressed in. It's uh, it's slid in from the side, so you put on the discs, and now it can't come out. And also, um, on the lock bar side, it works as a over travel protection. So after we, I made the first accomplice frame lock that way. Um, I I really liked that. I said, you know, Jesus, it's uh, it gives us a, a spot to put something special. Even if we just anodize it, it looks nicer than if it wasn't there. And if someone wants, um, you know, Mokutai or uh, a Damascus of some type or Damas steel, these parts can be made out of almost anything, you know. So it gave us the opportunity to put it on other areas than just a backspacer and a clip. So that so that's why we stuck with the, the disc. And now I think when, you know, people see the disc, they, they realize that, that Skiff made – Guys probably did that. <laughs> Definitely, it's a it's a signature uh, design flourish, but it's, it's, got, it's got great utility, and it also I would imagine cuts down on weight because it's one less piece, you know. Uh, and it yeah, it's a it's a it's an innovation, and and people I, I think knife people want to see some active thought, not just beauty going into their into the knives, especially knives that are higher end that they're spending you know, a good amount of money on, they want to see that it's not just, um, you know, beautiful execution. They want to see that some innovation, some thought has gone in and that there's something a little different. It's like you look at, you know, artists throughout history, you know, Picasso, he, he decided he was uh, at 15. He nailed it. So he started doing crazy, crazy stuff and changed art forever because um, he was able to, uh, you know, innovate. And that's what people want, especially out of a nice, expensive knife. And I think it's interesting you mentioned, I was looking at the milling strictly visually because I've never felt one of your knives in my hands. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I would imagine it is it is half visual, half utilitarian, because that milling keeps that thing in your hand in a beautiful right. way. Yeah, we, de we definitely, uh, you know, try to do different stuff. Um, we, we see what's out there and we try not to focus on other people's work or we look at it. We try not to like let it sink into our brains because then we don't want to be influenced by it. We don't want to try to come up with the same kind of thing somebody else is doing. Uh, and that's hard, especially with Instagram and being so active on Instagram, you see a ton of knife knives out there. And next time you come out with something, you're like, Oh, that kind of looks like, like this, or it kind of looks like this. You're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I hope nobody thinks that, you know, that we kind of came up with the same thing. And, and we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that and trying to come up with new stuff um, like the 3D milling. I know people are doing 3D milling already, but it was really a lot of like uh, tight space lines or they were trying to make a really nice smooth surface. And we, were, we decided that we would uh, try to make it more of a, a textured surface and spread the lines out a lot. So that way you could really see them and they would be really grippy and it, it worked out well. Um, the old, Like my, like he, my father said about the, the discs that at the time – we really didn't see a lot of people doing that. Um, and in the beginning, I really didn't like it. I was like, I don't know, this looks kind of weird, the, the big disc. And it just, I didn't I didn't like it. I mean, but I didn't know enough about it to say, oh, it's not going to work. And we started doing it and it was working really well. And then people started identifying us with that. So we, we kept doing it. And on this last knife, my dad actually had said something about uh, decided not to do the disc. Like, oh, let's do something else. I'm like, well, I know I kind of want to do the disc because it is kind of like our signature. It's like our design language. And I think people kind of expect that from us. And I really like the options that it gives us for color, for material choice, if we want to do different materials in the disc. Uh, but so we definitely try to do different things. Uh, interesting you should say that because, yeah, it, it a signature thing should be held on to. I don't mean that you cling to it desperately forever mm -hmm. uh but you know you you haven't you haven't been uh, at the forefront of everyone's minds forever so why not stick with that thing for a while and 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 exhaust it uh as a as a design feature and uh you know see see what that evolves into soon it'll be a triangle <laughs> 
perhaps. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, I've had some customers ask if we're going to go to a shape instead of a circle. Yeah. And, uh, we, we thought of it. We just haven't figured out how to do it exactly time and time over again yet. But you'll probably see something other than a, a disc on there someday. Something really difficult to program and mill, you know, something very. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Something that could you know, make a guy go crazy. <laughs> yeah. A rhombus. Please put a rhombus pivot in. So have you have you guys had I mean, uh, you are uh, uh, the talk of the town. So have you had uh, any uh, manufacturers reaching out to you sniffing around? Hey, so you have any interest in uh, licensing your knives? And I don't mean to portray uh, mm -hmm. manufacturers as sleazy. I, I realize that's mm -hmm. what I just did. But uh, because actually it's due to those manufacturers that uh, many of us can get designs in their hands that they otherwise <laughs> be able to afford uh, mm -hmm. so i'm grateful to that uh that service they do but have have manufacturers reached out to you to try and reproduce some of these yeah um absolutely i think three different ones um how do you feel about it cool. yeah, you know it's nice they want to um i feel actually more successful when someone asks you hey can you know we get and i'm making this knife steve and i have talked about it many times um, mostly what it comes down to it has nothing to do with the manufacturers not making a good product to make a great product, mm -hmm. um, especially at the price points. You know, a knife we're getting seven or eight hundred dollars for, they're going to make for two hundred or two twenty, maybe two fifty. It's going to be a very nice knife. Um, our our biggest problem is we feel uh, like one of them, for instance, was the Bandit. Um, we may make the Bandit again, but we feel if, if they started making it. We're, we probably wouldn't make it anymore. Um, sure, I could make a few one-offs with some really fancy materials, but we're not going to make what we would call our standard materials knife. Um, like a run of 50, like you... Yeah, like we do now if they were making it. So we would feel like we're, we're done making it at that point. And um, I guess we just haven't felt at the point that we would just want to give it up yet. I mean, because on their end, I mean, we're not even touching the knife. So any money we get for it is nice, but in the end, it's not that much money to say, okay, we're not going to make it anymore, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at at this point about it. So now this might sound a little woo-woo, but but in a way, uh, as soon as, and, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but as soon as you license a design and that design starts being made uh, by someone else and you're also making it, or maybe you're not still making it, it seems like some of the soul is sucked out of that design. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's me just being corny about it. But um, to me, the incentive to find, to do the work, to find an original or to wait like a mature adult for the original to be made for me or, or however it is, um, is, is lessened by kind of like inflation by mm -hmm. the fact that uh, a Wii or a Riot, and I'm not impugning them in any way. I think they're awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, but is making that design. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah, that there's I mean, anything? I'm sure Steve has something to say about it. We've talked many times about it. With, you know, Steve, some Steve, things Steve are, do you uh, think your, your knives have a soul because you've touched them and you've been so close to them? Yeah, it's they are special to us. I mean, they're almost like like kids, the designs themselves. We, we only have a handful of designs that we put a lot of work into. Um, we spend all our time making the knives and we don't have a whole lot of time to design knives. So at this point in the game, we're not making a bunch of designs that we, we have sitting in the back. We have a handful that we're thinking about and, and mulling over and trying to figure out because we want to make like one or two knife designs a year, um, mm -hmm. new ones, and try to get those out. Um, it does take a little while, the R&D part of it, especially um, since I'm not full-time. My father is. So uh, we, we're limited there. So giving up, you know, a, a quarter of our designs that we really can't make again. It, it's a, uh, it's not an easy pill to swallow. You know, then mm -hmm. we can't, we, like you said, we can make a couple one-offs, but we're kind of giving up on that one. And we don't really like that because we do want to go back and redo it or make more of them. So I, I think there's definitely something lost there. Yeah. I, I, uh, uh, I'm on the fence about that. I would agree with you. On one, I would agree with you if I put myself in your perspective, and as someone who's done a lot of uh, creative things in my life and art and that kind of thing, I would agree with you on that end. And then as a consumer, <laughs> I'm like, 
yeah, but it would be awful nice to have a great representation. But mm -hmm. but 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 the way I see it is that uh, you know, uh, and not that you asked, but <laughs> I think you're smart in doing that, and and it you know it keeps excitement around the knives in a in a in a way it keeps everything uh, keeps the energy around your designs elevated and it's exciting you know when uh we've had a couple of guys come on to thursday night knives too um and show off your knives and it's you know it's like wow put a hold it up to the camera you know and they it, and they always talk about how thin behind the edge it is which is which is a, a, a current day compliment you know huge compliment to your grinding and they always show off the milling and then there's an inherent beauty in them uh because of the attention you take even you know you call them your basic material knives mm -hmm. but, but to me some sometimes the basic material knives are the most beautiful mm -hmm. um so thank you for saying that because that's the way i i looked at it in the beginning was um uh you're just trying to make it look real clean and and, and look good with basic materials trying to have its own beauty somehow you know i mean sometimes I, I, we get carried away and then we put a lot of other things on it too but i i still like the way the our uh our standard knives look you know so, Steve, if you were on a podcast and someone forced you to describe your style and define your style as a as a designer, if if you were designing and, and it never actually even came into anyone's hands, but you're just purely the design, how would you describe your style? I don't know if there is such a style, you know, um, when I'm starting to to um, to make the knife, I'm looking at the whole thing. Um, I'm looking from tip to um, the tail of it. Um, I'm also looking to not have it look handle big. You know, I'm always trying to get as much blade out of the handle as you can. Um, you know, it, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm taking um, a shape in one area of the knife and I'm applying it to another part of the knife. Um, at, you know, as I'm as I'm drawing it out in the beginning, I'll, I'll take a curve that's on one part of the knife and um, put it on another part of the knife. It's hard to explain, but um, I'm moving these little shapes around until I have overall what I'm looking for. And, and then, you know, I'll start refining it. Uh, that sounds to me a lot like painting. You look at a painting and it's got a dominant color, but it also has other colors in it and they're dispersed throughout the painting, not necessarily for evenness, but to create a flow for your eye, you know, a, a dynamism. And there's a, a repetition there um, in a compositional way that, that, that makes the thing dynamic, that makes the thing move, whether it's moving or not. Like on our culprit, the easiest way to show it would be on the very front of the knife. Um, you know, it's uh, it's an angle that from one edge looks like a pyramid. You know, if you, if you hold it straight up with the blade closed, it's kind of a pyramid shape. Um, so then we do that on, on the backspacer, that same exact angle. And, and, and that's what we call a pyramid shaped backspacer. And then for a while we were doing it on the clip, um, just, you know, um, putting that same pyramid shape on other parts of the knife, just to make it a package, you know, um, that's in its simplest forms of doing it. And, and, uh, the rest is, um, other spots as I'm drawing it out, a lot of times I'm drawing around, you know, a round shape on the paper and I'll just move it in different parts of the knife you wouldn't think of. And it's just sitting in there and you wouldn't know it until um, I, I showed you a drawing of it or something, you know. Right. But your eye sees it. You, you might see it. it. You see it and you don't maybe realize that I did it that way. And you'll, in, um, I don't even know how to explain it, you know. So what uh, advice would you give uh, people who are passionate about knives and want to go into that industry, uh, you know, as makers, what, what, uh, what one piece of advice would both of you guys have for that person? Steven? Mm. Let's see. Well, I know starting out, it's, it's really hard for people to start out. So, I mean, I think the best advice is to just do it. Just get going, get started, do something and then iterate on it. Your first at bat is probably not going to be good. Um, I know I made a bunch of junk on my machines uh, before I made anything even remotely usable and he still had to grind it and shape it right. I just took a bunch of material off it for him. So, you know, you, you're not going to knock it out of the park your first times, but you got to get started. 
before you do anything. So stop thinking about it and just start doing it. Take that first step. Steve. Yeah, absolutely. Take, take that first step and, uh, you know, don't, don't give up. I mean, we all make a lot of stuff we throw away before we even show anybody where we're coming to, you know. Um, and, and um, you know, Instagram's really nice now. Um, I used to tell people, I, I actually um, had a guy that just moved away that I used to work with that came over to wanting to learn how to make knives. And, you know, I'd say, you got to go to a show where there's a lot of other makers and see what, you know, you got to influence yourself on what's out there. There's so many other things out there that don't come into your head till you start looking around. And then, you know, you have your own ideas get expanded by looking at what other people are doing and uh, see what materials are to work with out there. And, uh, you know, yeah. when he first came over, he, you know, he said, well, Hey, what's, what's the best blade steel to use? And I said, Oh, there's no such thing as the best. Blade. <laughs> I what's said, if right? you're new, you got to get something that's inexpensive and something, you know, maybe you can heat treat yourself. So you're not sending it out. But I, I said, eventually most of us go with something that, um, you know, uh, like a, a stainless that requires, um, more than just heating it up, cherry red and quenching it, you know? Um, I said, but start out with the simple stuff and, you know, you're going to grind a lot of bad stuff and eventually uh, you'll start grinding um, some nice stuff. And um, he said, well, I got this pattern. I was thinking about cutting out 10 of these. I like, I don't cut out 10, <laughs> <laughs> cut out two or three. Cause believe me, no one makes 10 of anything in the beginning. You're going to make them first three knives. Think it's the best knife you ever made. And after four or five of them, you won't even make anything that looks like it anymore. You'll have a totally different shape because you learn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I think all of us, you know, our first 10 or 15 knives don't look anything alike from the one you made before that. And uh, yeah, just, just stay at it. Don't, don't give up, you know? So what do you, what do you guys see in the future? Are you going to, are you going to maintain this? Uh, Steven, do you plan to go full time? I know I'm asking you a lot of personal questions. You're like, I, I haven't even talked about this with my wife yet, but I mean, are you, <laughs> so, are you, you know, okay. <laughs> it, it, it's a common theme. Uh, we talk about this pretty often is I do want to go full time. I do want to do more of this knife making stuff. I want to do more things in general. Um, you know, I need to upgrade my mill. I need to get up to a certain point so I can take the leap and be full time. Uh, but it, it's, it's definitely in the future. We want to make more knives, more uh, types of parts for, for customers, I you know we, we I make and sell the bearings. Yes. Um, that's been really big. I have some more ideas that I want to uh, work on that are in the same vein. I just don't have the time to work on them right now. Um, we have more knife designs. I mean, we have lots of stuff we want to do. We talk about new things all the time, and we just lack the time. All right. Yeah. So before we wrap, I, I'm sorry, I, I totally forgot to ask you about your bearings. Tell me a little bit about those, and 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 they've. I mean, they've. I, I hear about them all the time. They've been a wild success. Yeah, they have been really successful. Um, I didn't really make them, you know, to sell them per se. We w we wanted to make something for our own knives. Um, I know cage bearings are, are nothing new, really. Lots of people use them. They make them. Um, we were using IKBS for a while, and then uh, we needed something a little different because it was a pain in the butt putting all those bearings in. So my dad came over one day and said, hey, uh, what do you think about just, you know, making a little bearing and we just drill a bunch of holes in it, and then we can – drop the balls in there and I'll keep them in track. And I was like, okay, well give me five minutes. So I quickly. Yeah, five minutes. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and, uh, and I, I, you know, put them in CAD, made the cam and I said, all right, let's go outside. And uh, we took a piece of, I forget what it was titanium. I think I had laying around that was the right thickness and we made them and they worked right away. And it was literally, you know, an, an hour, I think of actual work. And we had the first that they weren't caged. You know, it was like a, a through hole, but it got us going. And before long, other makers wanted them. So I was like, oh, I'll make them for you. And then before long, I'm like, oh, I'll make more. And then people were like, well, it'd be nice if they were caged. So um, mm -hmm. I I was on the fence about it. I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't really want to do that. And then at a show, Andre Thorburn uh, kind of gave me some crap about it. and was like, no, these should be caged. And you just do it like this, this, and this. And then you just hit it with a hammer and knock the balls in. So I'm like, well, all right, I'll try it for you, Andre. So I, I tried it and it worked out really well. It was much easier than I thought it was going to be. And cool. I started making a bunch more and it's been really, you know, working out really well. So that makes it way a hell of a lot caged uh, through hole, meaning the bearings can just go easily uh, in and out of the washer 
Uh, whereas when it's caged, they're trapped in there. You can pick up the washer, move it around, and nothing's falling out. Um, right. That's uh, okay. So when when you did that, that made the biggest difference, I would imagine. I mean, yeah, it had to came. It, it had to go through these steps to come to fruition. As he said, I was using IKBS. It was working really well. It was a system that Andre Thorburn taught me, and it was it was beautiful. I used it for a long time, but it was time to change as we were um, changing how we were making the knives, basically, because we're integrating each other now. I'm not just by myself. Right, and right. I, you know, the nice thing about the IKBS is there's so many balls in there, and most of the bearings you buy, you know, only have, you know, seven or eight, maybe nine balls on there. And I said, I, I really like the support of the IKBS. I said, I would like to either make a ring that holds the balls all the way out to the outside edge or with a washer where they're not um, actually um, caged in there. You can get them really close together. So we were we were taking um, where you would normally get eight or nine balls in there. We were getting 13 balls in that same spot. But we, yeah, had, was- to, we had to through hole at that point. It, it worked real nice. Um, had a lot of support because we had more balls in there, and that's what really what we wanted. Um, but as Steve um, investigated more on it and talked to Andre Thorburn about it, they he figured out basically take one ball out, I think is what it amounted to, and then they were caged. So we still had more balls in there, and then we can we can make them the size we want them. The other thing I wanted it was um, I wanted the bearing to track around the the pivot pin closer. The oh. ones that we were buying basically the not not all of them but the ones that we were getting at the time could orbit in there not follow the um the pivot pin close and the idea of following the pivot pin close means if you are going to run a track in there or something you can use that pivot pin and the bearing you have to run your track well so how do people how do knife makers buy your or or anyone buy your uh your uh, multi-row bearing uh caged uh, pivots or uh, not the, not the pivots but uh, the washers how do people get your knives that's what people really want and not that they don't want your uh, your ball bearings but I mean man people people are dying for your knives what's the best way to get into a skiff made blade or is that just a naive question no I mean um, basically email um, skiff made blades so you guys have hot, hotmail.com my wife will answer um, you know we the the biggest it's, it's a nice problem, but our biggest problem is a weight. Um, I just, you know, I just can't make them fast enough. I'm trying. Um, actually, Nets, Steve and I have been talking that I need to get, um, you know, somebody to help me in the shop. Um, obviously, I'm going to be the guy still doing the grinding and assembling, but if I can have someone help me, um, you know, do a lot of deburring and, and making some of these parts we make, uh, would help a lot. So that's, I think that's where I'm at at this point is finding someone to help me so I can make them quicker. So as the orders come in, we can get them out quicker and not tell people, you know, you're going to have to wait, you know, two or three months on my custom orders. Sometimes you got to wait um, a couple of years even for something <laughs> totally one off. And uh, I know that sounds ridiculous to even the customer, but I don't, I have no other way of saying it, you know, Hey, gentlemen, looks like uh, we'd lost Bob for a minute. This is Jim. Um, mm-hmm. Anything else that uh, Bob didn't ask that you would like our uh, listeners or watchers to know about Skiff Made Blades? Uh, I can't think of anything. We talked about all the, the talking points we had. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, what we would like to say maybe at the end is, you know, thanks for having us, obviously, but um, that... Our customers, uh, they give us a lot of input, and we do listen to them, and we get a lot of our ideas of what they're asking us to make. All right. We've been putting up the uh, the website and the Instagram throughout the show, but, again, if you want to uh, give us that website address or any other kind of uh, contact information, I'll let you go ahead and do that now before we wrap up. All right. Uh, so the website is uh, skiffmadeblades.com. Uh, you can get the bearings there. We also try to do some drops every so often of uh, knives. So you can order some knives from there eventually. You can check us out on Instagram, which is usually where we uh, promote these drops ahead of time to let you people know. And uh, I'm Skiff Workshop on Instagram, and uh, my father is Skiff Made Blades on Instagram. All right. 
Yep. Steve Skiff, Steve Skiff Jr., we certainly do uh, thank you guys for being on the Knife Junkie podcast, and we apologize that uh, Bob uh, apparently uh, maybe had a thunderstorm and knocked out his power or something, but uh, sorry that he dropped off there, but uh, thank you guys so much for being on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks oh, yeah. for having us. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure.